Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Gregory Bott about entrepreneurship, governance, and leadership in the modern world. Dr. Gregory Bott, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hi, thanks, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Alberta, Canada. I am south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the world of acquisitions uh, and really from an entrepreneurial governance and leadership lens, just trying to understand how all of this plays into the ways organizations function in the modern world and how we can do that more effectively uh, within all this complexity and uncertainty that's swirling in the world all around us. As we get started, I wanted to share Greg's bio with everybody. Dr. Gregory Bott is an entrepreneur and investor. At age 24, he quit his full-time corporate employment in pursuit of both higher education and entrepreneurship. Since then, he has owned and operated numerous businesses across multiple industries, including hospitality, real estate, and agriculture. A governance and leadership expert with four degrees across three continents, he instructs at the University of Alberta and chairs one of the largest social services agencies in Alberta, Canada. And you can find out more about him at www.gregbot.com. What a tremendous background. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further to the conversation? I I think you got a lot of it. Um, More recently, I've been a lot more purposeful on, on where I spend my time. Um, and just really trying to narrow that down. And, and a lot of that lately is, you know, outside of the businesses has been this community service, which is working with or on nonprofit boards. And where I find I could contribute the most is in the ser- social service sector, just where my skill set and, and passion has, has been uh, more recently. And then the personal development, and that that's one where you can really relate to. And you know, I look at your bio and and everything with the with the academic piece. But more recently, you know, going back into the classroom and, and instructing on some of these topics, I find when you're teaching, it's you know, you think you're projecting a message to to students, but teaching is really a piece of self-reflection as well so as I was writing the book for example those two just worked hand in hand and you know if you have to teach it to somebody else and you're in front of a students you really think a lot more methodical about some of the material and, and relate that to to practice yeah I think that's absolutely true and it's one of the things as a teacher or a trainer in a corporate setting or whatever, I have to remind myself regularly that I'm going through that constant self-reflective practice uh, as I'm trying to figure out how, you know, what I'm going to share, how I'm going to share it in the most effective way possible. And I have to remember that I, I have to help people in the audience or students in the classroom uh, with those explicit connections that in my mind are obvious because I've gone through that thorough self-reflective process, but may not be obvious to, to those who are listening to me, right? And so part of, you know, curricular design, pedagogical approaches, uh, whether in a corporate setting or in the classroom is all about, you know, helping people make those connections, have those guideposts and, and be able to, you know, see the forest from the trees uh, from all the, the specific things you may be talking about. Uh, so yeah. that, that is a great, a great thing about doing what we do. And it's one of the reasons why I love it. 
Yeah, I find like my earlier academic or my earlier entrepreneurial career, I was very much in a, a silo. Um, you know, I had mentors and we had people that we leaned on, but it's very much in a silo. And more recently, you know, doing these types of podcasts, writing the book, it just more time for reflection. And, you know, the book, for example, I spent first year of the book reading and doing the research for that, I read 100, 120 books in, in, in that. And as I wrote, you know, I started writing the book thinking I had a message to tell. And over that time and in, in researching and reflecting, that message shifted and I came out with different principles and a different person having gone through that process. So you start it thinking you have a message and that message shifts as you really dive deep and reflect and you learn about yourself. The more you're, you're out there, the more you're talking to people, the more you, you know, when I do a podcast, I, I re-listen to it and, and think, you know, what can I learn from that and, and how can I do the next one better? So I think they just always be on, on a journey. And yeah, if you're talking and preaching to other people, you, you learn about yourself in the journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, good. You've already referred to the book a couple of times uh, and kind of your self-reflective journey there. Uh, obviously, so much uh, that goes into, you know, the, the writing of a book and, and you pour your heart and soul into it and you, you hope to share something that's going to be helpful to other people. Why don't you start now by telling us a little bit more about really why you wrote this book? Uh, and then we can start to get into some of the key, uh, get into some of the key takeaways uh, for listeners. So my, my previous experience with businesses had always been with startup, whether that be on our own or, or franchised. And there's a lot of risks and, and things that are inherent with, with the startup that provide for, um, you know, a lot more swings in, in your, your wealth, a lot more swings in, in your emotion. And a few years ago, we had, we had shifted and one of the companies that we owned undertook an acquisition. So we purchased the business of a competitor and, and merged that into our, our existing organization. And I remember, you know, sitting back a month into this and, and looking up at my business partner and just saying, you know, that, that was a little bit too smooth. We had just doubled the size of our company or I guess tripled it just with one signature and we woke up the next day and we were, we were three times the size and we had spent the number of years prior to that, just trying to get where we were and then just to have this success overnight. And that made me kind of step back and, and think about, you know, why, why did that work? And there's gotta be more to this and, and why aren't more, more people doing this? And what I realized in that reflection is that when we think about entrepreneurship, we, we tend to think about entrepreneurship and, and the startup as, as synonyms. And, and it's nobody really thinks about it as the acquisition. And I think a lot of that is the news that we hear and what's portrayed in the media are these really sexy stories of young individuals. They, they start this tech company in their parents' basement and, you know, in their mid twenties or early thirties, they become billionaires. And these are the stories that we gravitate to. And there are, but in reality, they're, they're the outliers. They're not what the data suggests and they're not actually the norms. They're just anecdotes and, and outliers. And in reality, if you take a more objective approach or, or reflection on this, the startup tends not to have a very strong risk reward trade-off. And that's what leads to the high failure rates. So with an acquisition, you really have some history to that and you have there's just so many things that that come with an acquisition that you don't have with the startup and you know for example when you buy a business you have a proven reoccurring revenue stream with a proven history so you actually have some data to analyze it's not a guess and test model you're looking at that and and you know what you're purchasing with some safety net you have an existing customer base so you know they're purchasing history you know they're um, their trends, the amount that they purchase, what frequency, the products they've been tested and, and, and refined. So you have this proven value to the customer that you're not having to reinvent the wheel. That's already been done. Somebody's gone through that process. In, in our acquisition, we inherited some really strong staff. And that's what kept those relationships with the customer and, and suppliers. And they were already trained they're developed and they're just exactly what our business needed at that time and one of the biggest things for for scaling a business is making sure it gets to the point that 
there's existing systems and, and processes in place. And as long as you're buying a business that's reached that level of maturity, they should have that system and processes and, and structure. And all you really need to do is, is tweak and, and play with that. And it's really easy to bounce off of that existing model. Oh, and it, you can take that to the next level a lot easier than you can taking a startup to, to, to where that last owner left off. I think a good example is, you know, the business that we bought, the previous owner had been in that grind for 10 years. He had missed, you know, kids soccer games, his wife had some health issues and he didn't always feel that, that he could be there for that. And, and it took him a lot of time to get, up to that level where he felt the business had that process and structure where someone could bounce off. And we just stepped in and, and inherited that with, with a signature. And now it's a lot easier for us to, to, to go and, and run with that. Um, so just, I think that was just the story that, that I wanted to tell because it's, it's not a common story. And a lot of people just having that startup and act, um, startup and entrepreneurship as, as synonyms people don't think of or see themselves in this acquisition or, or, or merger journey where in reality it's it's an opportunity that that's open to anybody we just don't think of that and it's not our first reaction when we think about entrepreneurship yeah yeah uh, super interesting uh, story and examples you know that you're sharing here and yeah I talked to lots of of entrepreneurs or solopreneurs um, who are thinking about scaling or who have had success scaling. And you just bring up a really, really important point that it is so challenging to, to systematically scale in a productive, healthy way um, to scale a business. And while that's certainly one option, like over time, you just, you, you grow in revenues and client base, you add more employees, you scale your business. Uh, I live, you know, south of Salt Lake City. It's a tech corridor. We have lots of unicorns here. We have lots of tech companies that are growing like at crazy rapid paces. So you live in that, if you live in that kind of an environment and you see it all around you, you just think, oh, well, that's what you do. Everyone scales. Like, you know what they also do? They're constantly going through mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> um, and, and that is also how they help to fuel the growth, right? And, and so I need to be really mindful about that as I'm thinking about my grind in my business. Um, if, you know, most people, 80 plus percent of the U.S. economy is based on small business. Um, mm -hmm. And so most people are in small business. I don't know how it is in Canada, but it's probably something similar. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and most people are in small businesses. And most people stay in small businesses. So if you're really looking for growth and scaling, what you're sharing is just a really important component to that, that we just can't ignore. And, and people do have success in startups and I don't want to diminish that. Um, but I like to think about wealth, you know, businesses building wealth and that's a lot of why people are in it. You know, there's this personal fulfillment and other reasons to be in it. Uh, you know, give back, develop a certain income so you can give back to a community. But if we look at business uh, as wealth accumulation, startups are, they have these cycles. You're, you know, you have ups and downs, you have failures and, you know, you take a step forward and then you get hit and you take two steps back where we look at earlier literature on wealth accumulation. It always talks about incremental gains. So if you can just gain that 10% or, or a certain amount every year and you have cumulative returns, that's what builds wealth over time in what acquisitions does. And some of these attributes I, I talk about as an acquisition, it's really building that moat around your wealth and looking at your journey of, of wealth and putting as much priority on wealth retention as you do on accumulation. So it's protecting every time you gain, you're protecting that gain and you're not risking what you've built in order to go to the, to the next level. And that's what an acquisition does when you talk about the, the systems and you talk about the, the proven history and really having some hard data to analyze and not moving into a, a you know, that guess and test mode. So let, let's say anyone listening, you're thinking about scaling your business and you're thinking about this, this acquisition uh, approach, 
what are some of the specific things I need to be considering if I'm trying to decide whether I just want to kind of slowly grow organically over time, or if I want to go the acquisitions route and engaging what seems to be right for me and for my business. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Yeah, I think there's, there's a few things. One is buying the right business. So that's setting yourself up for success. And then once you've done that, it's building in processes and systems, which would follow you know, more of a Michael Gerber philosophy. And you know, there's more contemporary authors on that, like, like Alison Maslin. So when I, when I talk about purchasing a business, I really think have this fixation on the stability or or dull businesses and what you get with purchasing that I look at fundamentals um, in order to set yourself up for success and and buying an enduring business. So things like, is it a fixed cost versus a variable cost model where a fixed cost, you know, we saw a lot of organizations in COVID close their doors and they tended to be ones that had we're in a fixed cost model. They had storefronts or, or retail. And when their revenues dropped, they quite quickly went below their break even in a blow that you know, high commercial rents and they didn't have any choice but to shut their doors. Where one's in a variable cost model, you know, if their revenue dropped, their, their costs dropped proportionately. So although they're making less money, they were still surviving. And that just took out, that was one piece of, of risk that, that the fixed cost model had. And it's also easier to scale a variable cost model because you're not necessarily needing these in, um, large capital injections in order to, to scale the business. You can just add, add expenses that follow that, that increase in revenue. Um, other ones, recurring versus non-recurring revenue. You know, if you have to constantly go rebid on on jobs, you're always at, at risk of, you know, not having this predictable revenue. Where companies that have subscriptions or longer-term contracts, they just have this safety net that they can. You know, one of our organizations, I can tell you, six months, eight months out, what our revenue is within 10 percent. You know, we still have the option of growing that. But I know where our customers' lo- loyalty is. I know what our uh, attrition is, and, and I can tell you that where a lot of businesses can, and a lot of businesses that I've been in, um, we didn't have that either. Things like customer concentration when you're doing your due diligence. What percentage of customers make up your you know top 10, 20 percent of revenue? So if you bought this business and your top two or three customers left, what would that do to your business? And if they make up a large portion of the revenue, you could be left debt servicing this company and have this cost to, to carry that, but your, your revenue disappeared. So again, a kind of a risk mitigation strategy that you look at in due diligence. And then really seeking just in general, um, is this the type of an industry that is going to be here 10, 20, 30 years out, whether you're still the rightful owner of that business or, or somebody else is, is that an industry that, that's going to be around? And a lot of 
authors and academics talk about, you know, this inverse relationship between glamorous companies that tend to be trendy and, and long-term profitability. So really, you know, you still look for a business where your, your passions are aligned, your, it's missing the ingredient of what you're good at. So if you're good at operations or if you're good at marketing, find a, a business that, that needs those skill sets at that time to be the owner of that, but really look at miss risk mitigation in that to make sure that you have a stable business. And then this business is going to give you returns and, and cash flow over the next number of years that, that you have it. Yeah. And in all of this too, you have the people management components, the leadership components. So you refer to earlier, you have with one sign of the signature, all of a sudden, you know, you, you scaled over time, you put all this blood, sweat and tears into it. And now just overnight, you, you've grown your business so much now, like legally, technically on paper, you've grown your business. But there's also then you like have to figure out how you're all going to be working together in the same organization, how you how you, all the governance components go into that all of the systems, the processes, the culture, the onboarding, like just mm-hmm. all the policies and practices of the organization, how you're going to get people onto the same page. And I'm wondering if you could talk to that for a minute about some of the things we need to consider or some maybe some of the the good things and challenging things you faced as you've done that in your own career. Yeah, I think integration is a big one in culture. Um, so one organization that I'm working with right now, we're looking at some level of the pendulum of whether merging or, or just working with another organization. And we're really going to different levels of the organization and trying to understand culture. So if we were to do this, or if we were... we're to land on a certain level of that, that pendulum, how would staff react? How would the management style of this organization be able to work with the, the staff of, of this other organization? So I think culture, every organization just takes on a culture. And, and you know, you could probably speak to this, this better than, than myself, but just making sure that you really understand that. It doesn't mean that it's an insurmountable hurdle. It just means that you really have to be aware of it and there's so many little hidden intricacies where um and preferences that you just need to to be aware of within culture but if you get it right it it really works um in in our last acquisition we realized really shortly um that there's things that they were doing better than us and we observe uh, absorb their processes and, and structure into into the kind of the greater merged organization and there is some things on the, the tech side and the process side that that we were doing better but we had the the ability to then pick and choose because we were pulling from two organizations and two skill sets and two cultures and, and we could really like cherry pick what we wanted and the greater organization um the merged organization was better collectively than each individual so in that case you know two plus two equaled five or, or, or six and, and that also came out on the bottom line because as we merged you know we had two offices came to, to one office on, on a, you know, from a fixed cost perspective and, you know, unfor- not unfortunately, but four staff plus 10 staff didn't equal 14. Um, so there's some efficiencies there and, and, you know, it worked out for, for everybody, but it just, you know, from, from an economics of it and from a culture perspective and from a systems perspective, there's just so much learning on, on both sides where the greater organization is better than the individual components in a merger. Yeah. You've, you described that so well uh, that, and, and it's, it's, it's a problem I see in many organizations, uh, especially when it's an acquisition um, that you have, you know, the, the acquiring company that then says, okay, you are now going to assimilate to everything that we do. Now, mm. there, there's a certain time and place for, I suppose, that kind of an approach. But more often, what's a healthier approach is how you just described it, <laughs> where you, you look at the, the, the competencies, the capabilities of both organizations that are now coming together, and you're looking 
to learn both ways, right? So the the thing, the strengths of the the acquiring company that you tried to then build into the culture and the processes, the systems of this newly formed organization, right? That is now um, grown, uh, but also the, the company that, is, that has been acquired. Just because that organization has been acquired doesn't mean they don't have capabilities to bring to the table. And in fact, the opposite should be true if you just acquired them, right? They should they should have human capital, um, financial capital, intellectual property systems, technologies, whatever. They should have things that add value to the organization. Otherwise you wouldn't have acquired them in the first place. Recognize that, tap into that, pull that into your organization. And like you said, culture, it, it's it's a challenging thing. And, and there's no like, prescription for this. It's it's just, you have to be mindful about it. You have to be proactive about it. And you just have to be intentional about um, putting the time and energy uh, and resources into to creating and sustaining the type of culture that you want. And so, you know, I don't have the answer for any specific organization. I can't just sit here and tell you, okay, this is what you should do. It depends, right? It depends on organizational context. It depends on the people involved. It depends on the organizations that have just merged or have gone through the acquisition. All of that depends on, on what you're going to do. But as long as you're it, as long as it's at the forefront of your mind that this is something that's going to be really important that you have to be thinking mm-hmm. about and considering, I, I think you're you're up for the challenge. You're going to be able to do it. And you described uh, some really important things to consider as we're going through that process. Yeah, you just made me think of another thing is in an acquisition or any type of organizational change, there's always this fear of flight risk. So while we lose customers, if we bring them into a different umbrella well we lose staff and i find a lot of those fears are unfounded um you don't lose staff and and you don't lose customers from a staff perspective if you are open ears you're listening you're empathetic you get to that conversation early and ahead of that conversation people are looking for for purpose they're looking for you know no one they don't want to uproot their their own career if they don't have to um so if you're they're early, you're in those conversations, you're, you're listening, you're providing opportunity, you're taking some of their skill sets and, and recognizing that within the greater organization. People aren't flight risk. You can do a, a merge or an acquisition without losing any staff. And the same is with customers. On, on our last one, that was one of my biggest fears because I, you know, I was fairly green to that type of a, a transition. And I just had this fear of, you know, what happens is 10% of our customers just don't like this new branding and like we got to them early we phoned individually and they were just like they hadn't actually had that love for a long time and just by us reaching out and checking in and providing good service to them we didn't lose any customers um and we actually went back a number of months later and had the ability to to raise our our fees and there's no way I would have thought we could have done that when, you know, a few months prior to the acquisition, but we just built that relationship. And so I think, you know, that's part of it is just providing that, that opportunity for staff and the greater organization tends to have more capacity to, to provide that than the individuals, smaller organizations. Yep. Yep. Well said. Well, Greg, it has just been a pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in a few minutes, but uh, as we're starting to wrap things up before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, Yeah, you can visit my website, gregbot.com. It uh, has more about the book and my bio, and there's a way to reach out for me uh, to me uh, as well. Um, I just think lastly with with business and and acquisitions a lot of times when we look at media we look at larger companies we just don't see ourselves reflecting back in the mirror um, and these stereotypes of what we've been led to believe an uh, entrepreneur should should look like Um, we we don't we don't see that when we look in the mirror but in reality entrepreneurship is is open to, to anybody acquisitions are open to anybody no matter age education um current current wealth it's the business that builds wealth um not you don't need wealth before you start so just 
being open to it. And if it's something that, that you're interested in, just engage, engage with the literature and engage with people and, and, and start to engage with the grind. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. It has just been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about Greg and his team. Check out the book, check out all the great resources. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than Indigo Leadership the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.